Hello everyone, thank you for joining us and welcome to today's webinar brought to you in association with Aluminium International Today and the Aluminium World Fair. My name is Nadine Bloxham and I am the editor of Aluminium International Today magazine and also the content director for the Future Aluminium Forum. Now in light of this year's aluminium show being postponed to the 18th to the 20th of May 2021, Aluminium International Today and the show organisers have teamed up to offer this week-long series of online interactive presentations. All of the topics we are covering in the sessions this week are main themes that will be presented at the show in May. And you can see all the details on screen of how to register for your visitor pass next year. We started the week off with some great presentations from representatives from CRU, European Aluminium, the GDA and Reed Exhibitions, and we looked at the global and European recovery taking place across the aluminium sector, as well as where we have continued to see demand and predictions for what 2021 might bring, if we can actually predict anything these days. Yesterday then saw the focus turn towards green technologies, and we were made aware just how important a shift to renewable energies is in order to work towards our industry sustainability and carbon neutral targets. Now, if you missed either of these sessions, you can view these recordings and the slides online at www.aluminiumtoday.com forward slash online showcase. This link is in the chat box for you, so please feel free to click on this when you'd like to see what you might have missed. So today we turn our attention to aluminium applications, and we all know how versatile our material is. So our speakers today will explore its properties and benefits in both automotive and packaging. We have a great lineup of speakers for you and the format will see each of them present with some time afterwards for us to ask them individually some questions. And we will also hold a Q&A once all of the speakers have presented. So if you would like to ask a question to any of the speakers, then please just enter this into the designated Q&A box that will appear when we get started. Please also put the name of the speaker you would like to address your question to so I know who to ask. If you also have any general comments as we go along or would like to raise a point for discussion, then please use the main chat box to interact with other participants. And also don't worry if you miss anything, as mentioned, this webinar is being recorded and will be available to download. So you'll be sent a link as soon as the recording is available, but you will also be able to view this webinar and the previous ones I've mentioned online by clicking the link in the chat box. So to begin today's webinar, I would like to introduce Stig Tjota, who is the Vice President of Manufacturing at Hydro Primary Metal. Stig will be looking at sustainable material selection or sustainable metal selection, especially from a carbon footprint perspective. So I will hand over to you, Stig. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. So the presentation I will go through today is what we call sustainable material selection in vehicles from a life cycle perspective. Uh, and I have to acknowledge my, my colleague Lars Moen, which has participated in, in, in this work. So basically we will be discussing uh, three topics. First, the carbon footprint of aluminium. Secondly, uh, we will discuss a life cycle analysis of a C-class uh, vehicle, where we'll be comparing a uh, lightweight design versus a conventional uh, steel-based design. And we will also compare a uh, gasoline or an internal combustion engine vehicle with a battery electric vehicle. And then finally, we will discuss the business case of lightweighting for electrical vehicles before we go into uh, summing up. So, to the carbon footprint of aluminium. As we all know, uh, the carbon footprint of aluminium uh, rely heavily on uh, the production route. Uh, so, for instance, an aluminium uh, uh, based on fossil fuel as the electricity source will have a relatively high carbon footprint. And uh, taking the example from China, which is primarily a uh, fossil fuel based uh, uh, electricity grid, uh, the estimated carbon footprint is around 20 uh, kilo CO2 per kilo of aluminium. And due to the rapid expansion of the aluminium production in China in recent years, the, the carbon footprint uh, of the global average is 18 and has actually increased a little bit in recent years. 
if we then move to the carbon footprint of primary aluminium produced in Europe, it's 6.7, and it has actually gone somewhat down in recent years due to a higher share of renewable energy for, uh, as a basis for the production. And it's actually two to three times lower than the global average. If we go to uh, aluminium based on renewable energy sources, and I use our own uh, green aluminium brand as an example here, we call Hydro Reduxa, which is based on hydroelectric power, it will have a carbon footprint of around four, being four to five times lower than the, than the global average. And if we then go to uh, recycling of end of life scrap, uh, aluminium based on 100% recycling, will only have a carbon footprint in 0 0.5, which is a staggering 36 times lower than the, than the global average. So I put this up in order to, to understand that when we do a life cycle analysis of a product, uh, we cannot treat aluminium as an average. We really have to uh, treat it with the source and it can have a quite drastic impact on the total carbon footprint of any product and, and vehicles in particular, as we will see. So, when we compare different metals, we typically use a metric on kilo CO2 per kilo of material. But what we have to remember is that aluminium is a light metal, and footprint per kilo of material is maybe not the right metric. So if we compare, for instance, primary aluminium produced in Europe uh, with uh, hydro reduxa, or the aluminium based on renewable energy sources, with, for instance, steel, we can get the impression that from an ecological perspective, steel is the best option, having a footprint on slightly above two kilo of CO2 per kilo of material. However, we seldom replace one kilo of aluminium with one kilo of steel because aluminium is a light metal. And in fact, the density, the, the difference is three to one. So instead, if we look on the carbon footprint per volume unit of material, the picture changed quite drastically. Then we have that primary aluminium produced in Europe have a footprint more or less uh, similar to steel, while aluminium based on renewable energy sources will have a significantly lower carbon footprint. Now, in reality, we seldom take out 100% of the weight saving potential, replacing one cubic meter of steel with one cubic meter of aluminium. So in practice, the, the, it will be somewhere in between these two extreme cases. And uh, uh, European Aluminium issued a report called Unlocking the Lightweighting Potential a, a couple of years ago, analyzing the weight saving potential for different uh, parts. And typically, uh, the weight saving potential uh, using aluminium is 30 to 50 percent uh, compared to, for instance, a steel based uh, uh, design for the component. So when we then look upon this from a carbon footprint perspective, we have two effects. We have the reduced material use in the vehicle build phase. And of course, we have the reduced energy consumption also in the use phase. And to really understand the, the ecological impact on a material choice, we have to consider both of these. So we have to do a full life cycle analysis. Now, so let's go into the life cycle analysis. And this work we have carried out uh, in collaboration with a, a German research institute called FKA, which specializes in, in uh, automotive research uh, located in Aachen, Germany. And as I mentioned initially, we will consider an internal combustion engine with a battery electric vehicle with a reference configuration, which is steel. We will have the same two vehicles in the lightweight co configuration with aluminium, where we basically consider a full aluminium body. And then thirdly, we will look into the effect of applying aluminium from renewable sources. So basically the motivation is that we want to understand the net carbon footprint effect of light weighting in a life cycle perspective. Secondly, we want to understand how does low carbon aluminium impact the life cycle analysis. And thirdly, what is the effect for battery electric vehicles used in areas with different uh, power grid mixes 
although due to the time limitation in this presentation, I will only focus on Germany, which have a typical European grid mix. So how did we do that? Uh, the basis for this is a so-called uh, vehicle assessment model that FKA has developed, which is basically a huge database com containing data from a number of vehicles, but also including a number of, call it scaling equations. Uh, for instance, if you manage to uh, get the weight saving on the body of the car, you can also do uh, downsize the drivetrain somewhat while maintaining the performance of the vehicle. And you have that for a number of components. So it's a combination of a database and a, and a model. First, we define the reference vehicles with dimensions, engine, mass, material distribution, energy, etc., for both internal combustion engine and battery electric vehicle. Secondly, we, we consider lightweighting technologies. And in this case, we basically consider a full aluminium body, or predominantly aluminium body, I would say. Uh, what we also do consider is the secondary weight savings. Uh, so when we get a, a lightweight body, as I mentioned, we can, uh, can downsize, the, for instance, the drivetrain while maintaining the performance of the car, but also downsize certain components in the chassis on body uh, due to the lighter weight. And then the third uh, step is to compare it, uh, material distribution in a different vehicle's variants and carry out the full life cycle analysis. So let's look on the result. And here we have a C-class vehicle. Uh, uh, and uh, first starting with uh, weight reductions in total. So the steel reference vehicle had a total weight of 1,256 kilo. And by uh, applying a, a full aluminium body, we say at 173 kilo, which is 13.7% of the total weight of the car. In this 13.7% is 4.6% coming from these secondary uh, weight reductions. For a battery electric vehicle with a driving range per charge of 400 kilometer, the numbers are 11.8% and 190 uh, kilo in total. And here the secondary uh, weight reductions are 4%. Notice also that the total weight of a battery electric vehicle is significantly higher than a comparable combustion engine vehicle. Uh, and the reason for that is obviously the weight of the drivetrain uh, itself and, and particularly the, the battery pack. So how is the material distribution? And here we focus on the body uh, itself. So the reference vehicle is primarily a steel-based body with 78% steel and 1% aluminum only, and some other materials. And this is a typical, actually, body design for a, for a traditional C-class vehicle. Now, uh, considering a full aluminium body, which we know is commonly used for more high-end cars, although it's not so commonly used for C-class vehicles, uh, we basically replace 373 kilo of steel with 242 kilo of aluminium. And with that, for the body itself, we then achieve a 35% weight saving of the body, which fits quite well with, uh, with the estimates carried out by European Aluminium I mentioned previously, estimating 30 to 50% weight saving. The lightweight vehicle is predominantly an aluminium body with 68% aluminium, still 4% uh, steel and, re and retaining some of the other materials, a total weight being uh, 363 kilo. So I just go quickly through, through this one. This just gives a background for uh, the life cycle analysis carried out according to the normal standard. We consider a WLTP driving cycle up to 150,000 kilometers. And we consider the three material I mentioned already. Aluminium with footprint of European average, 6.7. Steel, 2.08. And aluminium from renewable energy sources with a footprint of four. Uh, we considered in the study, we considered various grid mixes. Here I will only show the one from Germany. 
and to the result. The way we present the result here is first having the footprint from the build phase of the car, including all raw material. And this is for the C-class internal combustion engine vehicle. This is the steel reference with a footprint of for the vehicle itself of around uh, 8.5 tons of CO2 per vehicle. On top of that, we put the use phase emissions uh, up to 150,000 kilometers, as I mentioned. And the first thing you can mention, you can see here is, of course, that uh, use phase emissions constitute approximately three quarter of the total life cycle emissions. And of course, and dominating the picture in a way. And it's of course for that reason, both legislation and OEMs has focused a lot on reducing the, the tailpipe emissions during the use phase. Uh, I put the numbers underneath. I will not go through the detailed numbers, but you have it for reference. Considering the lightweight vehicle with uh, using aluminium of European average footprint, the footprint of the build phase of the car uh, increase somewhat. So in a way we can say that the 13.7% weight saving we did achieve was not sufficient to fully compensate for the difference in footprint between steel and aluminium from Europe. If we go to aluminium from renewable energy sources, it is actually below the steel reference vehicle. So in this case, the 13% uh, weight saving we did have was more than sufficient to fully compensate for the differences in footprint between the materials. If we then look on the use phase, uh, the lightweight vehicle will have a, a lower uh, tailpipe emission. And after 150,000 kilometer, the total footprint will be below the steel reference vehicle. If we then go to, to the, to the a uh, version which is based on uh, aluminium from renewable energy sources, it had an advantage already from kilometer one and will obviously continue to increase that advantage during the use phase and have a total, a total advantage in a life cycle, life cycle perspective. Going back to the one based on, on aluminium of uh, European average footprint, the ecological break even point between the lightweight vehicle and the steel reference vehicle were at, uh, at uh, 167,000 kilometers, or six, sorry, 68,000 kilometers. And after that, it will be an ecological advantage with the lightweight uh, design. In total, uh, the lightweight design with uh, aluminium of European average was 3.4% uh, CO2 footprint while the one based on aluminium or from renewable energy sources had an 8.5% uh, advantage. Now, looking on a battery electric vehicle, which are charged in uh, Germany, uh, which have uh, yeah, close to 50% renewable energy in the grid mix uh, these days. Uh, and you should notice I put in with a dotted line the carbon footprint of the internal combustion engine vehicle. Uh, this is for the steel reference. The first thing you can notice is that the carbon footprint of the build phase of the vehicle is significantly higher than the comparable internal combustion engine uh, vehicle. And of course the reason for that is the heavier weight, but in particular also relatively high carbon footprint of the battery pack itself. However, the use phase emissions are significantly below the combustion engine uh, version. So in a total life cycle perspective, it's actually a, a fairly large advantage for the battery electric vehicle. And this is in contrast to some reports which has claimed opposite. But our study, study clearly showed that the battery electric vehicle from an ecological standpoint is significantly advantageous with a typical European grid mix. The other thing you can notice is that the build phase of the, of the emissions uh, is over half of the total life cycle emissions. And it is actually, relatively speaking, much more important compared to an internal combustion engine. And due to that, we believe that in order to decarbonize the transportation industry, we believe focus will will not only be on the tailpipe emissions, but more and more also focus on, on the build phase. And then raw material uh, production and selection is really the key element. Now, looking on the lightweight version, again, 
the carbon footprint of the build phase, it's slightly larger than the steel reference. While for the, for the version based on aluminium from renewable energy, energy, it's slightly lower already in the build phase. Uh, considering then the, the use phase, uh, a lightweight vehicle will still have an, an advantage in the use phase also for a battery electric vehicle. However, since the relative differences uh, between the build phase and the use phase is less, uh, so the use phase means less in, in the total picture, um, uh, the advantage is less compared to the, uh, the combustion engine version. So in this case, the, the ecological break-even is actually at 167,000 kilometers. For the one lightweight version based on energy from uh, or aluminium from renewable energy sources, of course, had an advantage already from the start and continue to build that. So in total, uh, that version in, uh, achieved a total carbon footprint saving of 8.1%. Now, let's consider the body itself, just to emphasize the, the importance of raw material selection in a carbon footprint perspective. So we consider the body only in this case, and the 242 kilo of the aluminium in the body for the internal combustion engine vehicle. And you remember for uh, the version of using primary aluminium uh, produced in Europe, had a total foot, the vehicle had a total footprint around uh, 10 tons. And the aluminium in the body then contributed uh, approximately 1.5 ton of those 10 tons. If that aluminium had been based on predominantly uh, fossil fuel, for instance, uh, using aluminium produced in China, the carbon footprint of the body itself would have been close to 5 ton and been a big share of the, of the total uh, carbon footprint of the vehicle. Using aluminium from renewable sources would be approximately five times lower than this, uh, around a ton. And if we had the possibility to use only recycled material, it would be nearly negligible. So the point here is that choosing the right aluminium version, so the raw material, offer significantly carbon footprint savings in the range three to up towards five tons, actually. And this is quite big considering that the total advantage in the use phase between the lightweight vehicle and the, and the steel reference was between two tons and two and a half tons. So in many ways, the, the uh, decarbonization opportunities is nearly higher in the build phase by choosing the right raw materials. And of course, due to that is together with the build phase having a, 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 a bigger relative importance, we believe that focus going forward will be more and more on, on uh, sourcing the right raw materials and focusing also on, on what we can say low carbon footprint materials, like aluminium from renewable energy sources or, or even use of scrap. So just before I sum up, a couple of words on the business case for lightweighting in electrical vehicles. There has been certain claims that the business case for lightweighting in, uh, in battery electric vehicles is not favorable due to the, uh, the regenerative uh, 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 charging of the batteries when you're going downhill. However, we did a fairly detailed analysis of this as well, uh, together with FKA using the vehicle assessment model, where we consider different uh, cost of the battery. Uh, so today the cost is between 250 and let's say 180 euros per uh, kilowatt hour. And estimates for the future is that it will be dropped to the range 150 to 100 euros per kilowatt hour. And the point here is that when you do a, a weight saving of the, of the vehicle itself, you can downscale also the drivetrain and the battery pack while maintaining a performance or a range. And due to the cost of the battery, that cost saving makes lightweighting a fairly attractive uh, business case, actually. So the traditional uh, uh, value of uh, weight saving for traditional internal combustion engine vehicle, we are normally used one to three 
euros per kilo. The advantage for a battery electric uh, compact car is 4 to 5 euro, and it's even higher for a uh, uh, SUV 7 to 10 kilos, uh, euros per kilo. So fairly attractive uh, business case. And of course, OEMs know this. Uh, as we know, the aluminium consumption in a battery electric vehicle is an average uh, close to 150 kilo per vehicle higher than for an internal combustion engine, and really driven by a favorable lightweighting business case. So moving into the summary, uh, sustainable material selection, as you have seen, should be based on a life cycle analysis. Comparing raw materials per kilo can lead to wrong conclusion. Secondly, for energy intensive uh, raw material as aluminium, indirect emissions from energy supplies to a large degree determine the footprint. Thirdly, weight savings can compensate for raw material footprint differences, both in the production phase and the use phases, as you have seen. And going forward, we believe that the uh, production phase footprint will receive increasing attention from both policymakers and OEMs as a mean to decarbonize vehicles. Hence, attention will then be on raw materials, which re really is, is the driving force for the whole vehicle uh, uh, footprint. And this will be particularly important for electric vehicles where the relative importance of the build phase is higher. Consequently, we expect that sourcing of sustainable raw materials, either based on renewable energy or recycling, will grow. And then finally, as you have seen, in electric vehicles, uh, the, the weight saving enables load sizing of the battery pack while maintaining uh, uh, performance of the car. And the secondary savings make lightweighting with aluminium a favorable business case, hence motivating an increased aluminium penetration. So with that, that I've put in some contact information if anybody wants to contact uh, us uh, later on. But with that, I think I uh, thank you for your attention. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sue. Really interesting presentation, and uh, you've certainly stirred some interest from our participants because we've had uh, questions coming in. I just before we go to some of those questions, I just want to ask your opinion. Really, you mentioned obviously this uh, the vehicle footprint, the overall vehicle pr footprint comes from uh, the materials production, which is uh, interesting to see. So, just in your opinion, do you think we should be focusing more on using? more recycled material or looking at uh, using aluminium, especially that's been produced with uh, renewable energies? Yes, that's a good, good question, uh, Nadine. I, uh, first of all, um, uh, I, I put in, I didn't mention it, but I put it in the presentation. Volvo actually did an analysis and basically concluded that 85% approximate of the vehicle footprint came from raw materials and only 15% for the different manufacturing and, and assembly steps. So raw material selection is really important to drive down the carbon footprint uh, uh, of the vehicle. And, and in my opinion, uh, uh, it needs to be a combination, I think. So I think uh, we will see a situation where uh, sourcing from renewable energy sources will, will increase, but also more and more uh, moving towards a more circular economy and using recycling. So I think we will see both. So I think we will see increased use of recycling material as well, at least for certain applications. Certainly, thank you. Uh, so a couple of the questions that have come through, I will I'll put to you now before we move on to our next speaker. Um, and one of these questions is that as we learn through your presentation uh, that carbon, the carbon footprint of steel-based cars is comparable to aluminium. Uh, this participant would like to ask, why are the majority of passenger cars still made from steel? Uh, yes, that's also a good question. And, and of course, uh, any designer need to consider a variety of dimension when they are choosing uh, concepts. Uh, and, uh, and so it's the, the cost factor, uh, it's the business case, it's the it's the properties they need. It's also the manufacturing infrastructure they have. So it's a lot of factors to 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 consider. 
but I think we have seen an increased penetration of aluminium over many years and, and continue to see that and actually accelerating uh, with electrification. Uh, but, but of course, these are slow processes and, and, uh, and you don't switch uh, uh, a component uh, over to another material in the whole industry overnight. So these are fairly slow processes, I think. But we believe we have a, a good business case for increased aluminium penetration in vehicles in general. Certainly, thank you. Um, and just another question that looks again at this idea of obviously looking at reducing the carbon footprint of aluminium at the source and more of the, the production process. Um, does this person ask if there is any potential or any possibility to look at reducing CO2 emissions in uh, the primary aluminium production? So I know uh, there are projects that are in place at the moment. Obviously, we're looking towards things like illicis and, and other other technical uh, or other technologies that can assist with this, but from Hydro's uh, point of view, is there anything specific that you you know you can offer on on how to reduce these CO2 emissions from the source? Yeah, it's also also a good question. Uh, of course, using electrolysis where you basically split aluminium oxide into pure aluminium, uh, and 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 uh, the oxide combines with the carbon from the electrodes and are emitted as, as CO2. So there is for electrolysis there is a lower uh, lower uh, uh, floor you could say for what is possible to achieve. But we are not at that floor for the moment. So by applying uh, about various type of technologies in electrolysis and and also uh, also uh, improving process control, we have a target of reducing uh, 30 percent uh, uh, within 2030. I think it's what we have said. So there are a significant potential also for for traditional electrolysis. Uh, in addition, of course, to, to source green raw materials like uh, alumina and, and other, other raw materials. So there are some opportunities. Of course, uh, the background for this question was probably also that there are people working on, uh, on inert type of anode uh, technologies, of course, which have the potential of being, uh, being uh, zero emission, at least if you use renewable energy as the energy source. And, um, but you will still have the same uh, same footprint for the raw materials you put in. Uh, but that also have a potential. Uh, I think it remains to be seen if that technology is cost competitive. Uh, so we are following that closely as well. But that's more the long term perspective, I think. Yes, definitely. Thank you very much, Stig. Uh, and just on that point, if uh, there is an interest on uh, kind of finding out a bit more about these sustainable technologies, we did have a presentation yesterday that went into a bit more detail on inner anode and uh, and the look at really developing renewable energies for uh, more of a sustainable supply chain and how we can go about that towards uh, low carbon neutrality in, in 2050. So I'd recommend having a look at that as well for some extra content. But for now, thank you very much, Stig. Really interesting presentation. And I hope everybody has enjoyed that. I will save some of the questions that we've also had come through uh, for the end of the webinar. So we've got some final points for discussion. Um, so for now, thank you, Stig. And I would like to now hand over to our next presenter, who is Ellen Vani, Managing Director of Ducker Frontier. Uh, Ellen will be looking at the evolution and outlook of aluminium in European and North American light vehicles. So we're sticking on this automotive theme and uh, looking forward to what Ellen has to say. So I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Ellen Vani. Thank you, Nadine, for the introduction. Thank you, Steve, uh, for your very good presentation. So it's a pleasure to participate in this online showcase with you today. Um, so because you certainly know we are doing um, regular basis, our well-known analysis of the aluminum content in light vehicle in both Europe and North America for the regional aluminum associations, uh, EA in Europe and AA in North America. Um, we have a very sound uh, uh, database uh, to compare the situation today and in the future in, in both regions. So this will be the main topic of uh, this presentation. So one word about uh, Dhaka Frontier. Uh, again, I'm sure you know us uh, through our well-known uh, syndicated work 
for the aluminum association, but actually our focus is uh, more on ad hoc uh, B2B studies for uh, um, indiv individual uh, clients uh, with a specific uh, market questions, uh, growth-related questions or, or pain points, uh, and uh, they need a, a fact-based analysis of uh, the market situation and evolution uh, before they are able to make uh, informed decision. Um, so we are providing this uh, market intelligence and consulting services um, at a global level, uh, thanks to our global footprint. We are based in Asia, in Europe, and uh, in North America. And uh, we are actually not only specialized on aluminum, or lightweighting materials or automotive and transportation, which is where we get the most exposure. We are also um, having very strong expertise uh, in the heavy equipment sector, in uh, building materials and construction, uh, in industrial and uh, specifically also uh, very active in the private equity uh, scene, uh, working uh, to support uh, commercial due diligences or um, a different kind of M&A uh, endeavors. Um, so we have been around for uh, 60 years now, uh, monitoring and analyzing the aluminum market uh, for uh, about two decades now in North America. It's been about 10 years in Europe. And with that, we have a very good foundation for our uh, view and opinion about what's uh, going on in the aluminum industry. So in order to understand um, the aluminum content situation in each region, of course, we have to be aware of the light vehicle production situation in each region because it directly impacts uh, the aluminum content um, uh, demand. So on the left side here, you will see the European Union uh, light vehicle uh, production uh, since 2017. It's forecast until 2026. So it's not a forecast we have been developing. We are using our partner LMC. Um, so these are the data from uh, August 2020. And, um, here you can see that already um, between 2017 and 2019, before COVID really had an impact, we were in a production cycle where we had decreasing production. Uh, so this is production, uh, this is not sales. Even though the figures are uh, quite similar, here we are looking at production because this is what matters in terms of aluminum demand. Um, so we were on, on a down uh, trend, but of course this downtrend, which was a couple of percentage decrease per year before COVID, has been strongly um, uh, enhanced by the COVID situation. So that uh, between 2019 and 2020, if we anticipate what the production will be until the end of the year, uh, we are having about 21% um, decrease in the production in Europe. And of course, if you look at the dotted line on top of the bars, you will see what was the original forecast before COVID. And uh, the forecasts were predicting um, yeah, stabilization of the market in 2020 before we turn to other growth. So at the end, we will still have a growth, uh, and, and as a DACA frontier, uh, even though this is not our business to do the production forecast, we believe that these actual forecasts are kind of realistic, um, that we will get back uh, to increase, uh, but of course, uh, it will take some time to go back to um, the 2019 level. So for Europe, uh, it is anticipated that we will return back to 2019, around 2003. And in North America, if you look at the right side, um, this should come a bit earlier, maybe six months or one year earlier. Um, but the decrease of production between 2019 and 2020 has been similar in percentage with 20%. Um, so that will explain, of course, that uh, as most of you know, being in the aluminum and automotive aluminum sector, uh, there is a strong 
drop in demand right now. Um, it's also important in order to compare the European and the North American market to have a look at the segmentation of the production because we have a very, very different picture here depending on the region. So on the left side, um, we look at the body type. Um, so conventional means uh, the sedan and hatchback market like we know it very well in Europe. Um, then you have the uh, uh, SUV and CUV for crossover segment. You have the sports vehicle, you have the vans, you have a couple of multi-purpose vehicles, and you have the pickup truck segment, which still counts uh, as light vehicle, uh, but it's a light truck, light vehicle segment. And this pickup truck segment is very typical for North America. It accounts for nearly uh, one-fourth of uh, the market, and this is a production segment that is not in existence in Europe. So that's one major difference to start with. And also, in um, North America, there is a different way to look at the SUV and CUV segment because it is um, related to a large vehicle, uh, and they count as light truck. Uh, which is not the case in Europe. So if you add up the pickup truck segments and the crossover and SUV segment in North America, you end up with 70% of North American production being related to light trucks, which is totally not the case in Europe. Uh, in Europe, uh, we are a, a conventional sedan hatchback market and, and production uh, market and, uh, of course, um, also uh, SUV market. So now if you look at the chart in the middle, um, we look at the vehicle segments, A, B, C, D, E. So um, you see that the A segment is not present or hardly present in the North American market. Uh, but that's also interesting to notice that we have a totally uh, um, contrary picture in North America and, and Europe because North America to 70% uh, is related to D and E segment vehicles, so very large vehicles, while in Europe this is exactly the reverse. You have about 70% of the market being related to C and below segments, uh, so with a strong domination of C and B segments. And now on the right side, uh, we look at the segmentation between premium vehicle models and non-premium vehicle models. And here you see also a major difference. Um, in North America, the premium market is uh, about 15% today, and this is twice uh, the penetration in, in Europe. We have 32%. And also within the premium segment, this is a different setup, because um, in Europe, the premium segment is really strongly focused on, um, uh, uh, no, sorry, the other way around. In North America, the premium sector is um, not only a D and E segment, uh, it's also three other segments. All right, so let's go to the next um, page. Uh, also, to understand um, the situation and evolution uh, to expect for uh, the aluminum content, we have to be very aware of the CO2 emission standards and targets. So here we look at Europe specifically, uh, European Union 28 uh, still, <laughs> and um, we look here at the passenger cars. Um, so in 2015, at the quick step back, we had a target of 130 gram per kilometer of CO2 emissions. Our current target for 2020, 2021 is 95 gram per kilometer. And um, the latest regulation adopted in uh, 2019 by the EU uh, now states that we have to reduce our CO2 emissions for new passenger cars by 15% as compared to the 95 gram, uh, which bring us in 2025 to a target of about 81 gram per kilometer. 
And going forward, uh, the new regulations say that by 2030, we have to decrease it by 37.5% as compared to today, which means as compared to today, a reduction of 36 grams per kilometer, which is significant. If you would count with an average um, um, 6 grams per kilometer, to emission saving uh, achieved by a mass saving of 100 kilograms. This would mean working alone with the mass saving that you would have to save 600 kilograms to achieve the 2030 uh, target. So this should showcase that mass saving or light weighting alone will not be sufficient to get there. So the right path to meet the target will obviously be a combination of several measures. Um, even though we have already very downsized engines in Europe and, and already very optimized powertrain, we still have some room for improvement on the ICE powertrains, which will help um, decrease uh, CO2 emission to some extent. Of course, electrification will be a, a, a a massive answer to uh, contribute to this um, CO2 emission reduction, and mass saving will be a strong contrib contributor as well, but alone this would not work. I also want to highlight that while electrification will be important to achieve the mass, to, to the CO2 reduction, um, electrification also requires light weighting, not in order to reduce the CO2 emission, if you are talking about a zero emission vehicle, but because uh, mass saving is needed on electric vehicles to offset the additional weight that is generated by electrification component and specifically the heavy battery. And also because it helps um, improve the range of these electric vehicles and also contribute to ensure a good vehicle handling, which is important for the customer uh, feeling and satisfaction. Now, looking at the North American CO2 emission standard and targets, um, um, we, here this is expressed in gram per mile and not in gram per kilometer. Um, the uh, new EPA standards that uh, apply uh, starting 2020 um, amount 1.5% uh, of annual CO2 emission reduction target. And this is what is being applied uh, today. But at the same time, you have um, a number of states following the California state. So these are actually 23 additional states uh, um, that are uh, suing the uh, Environmental Protection Agency for um, setting too low um, CO2 emission reduction target, they would like to achieve 2.7% of annual reduction, which is significantly higher than the 1.5 uh, applying today. So it is um, still very uncertain today um, how the lawsuit will um, unfold at the end, so if they will win or, or lose. Um, and another factor that will uh, play a role definitely in the future of the CO2 emission targets in the US and North America will be the outcome of the presidential election um, next month, um, because there are several scenarios here. If Donald Trump gets re-elected, um, it is to be expected that the EPA rule will further apply until um, 2026 or even 2028. While um, if uh, Joe Biden gets elected, um, it is more to be expected that stricter regulation will be voted. So, of course, we need to factor in that the new um, government would have to um, yeah, uh, take place and then uh, set a round of uh, uh, discussions with the uh, uh, automotive industry before they vote uh, a new standard. So that's why even with the new administration and the new rule, um, we expect that we will stick to 1.5% until at least 2022 or even 2023. 
and then maybe we would get to 2% um, of, of uh, CO2 emission reduction, some, some compromised trade-off scenario between the EPA and the COP1. All right, and um, to finish with this context introduction that is very important to understand the aluminum content situation, we need to look at the electrification trends. Um, so today in North America, on the left side, you see that we have 91% of ICE only vehicles. Um, and this is going to evolve based on the LMC forecast, which we think are realistic, um, towards 76% uh, of ICE only um, versus 9% of uh, mild hybrids and 7% uh, of full hybrid, 7% of uh, BEVs, and 2% uh, of uh, plug in hybrids. In Europe, um, the electrification trend is, is, is more advanced because today we already have a higher electrification rate and only 82% of IC only, uh, which is turning into expected 40% of IC only in 2026, with a very strong share of mild hybrid expected, 33%. And also a very strong share of a battery electric vehicle, 90%. The fuel cell is not expected to take off by, by that time, only 3%. And plug-in hybrid, even though there may be debate around this, if plug-in uh, could be higher than 7%, um, so far uh, we rather expect that the BEV uh, segment will be growing faster than the plug-in hybrid one. So, this shows that in both regions, electrification is picking up significantly. Uh, you see a major difference, though, between Europe and North America because the regulation are stricter in Europe. That's why the electrification trend is also stronger or faster than in North America. And um, you see also, even if this is a drastic change uh, toward electrification as compared to 2000. 19, that there is still a very big share of the market that remains IC only. So we need to keep that in mind as well. Now, coming to the point of what it means for our light vehicle aluminum content, we show you here on the left side the total aluminum content by product form. And on the right side, the average aluminum content per vehicle by product form. So on the left side, we are near to a total aluminum demand, but it does not include the scrap. So that's why it's an aluminum content and not an aluminum demand, because we are talking about net weight uh, and not about gross weight. Um, Obviously, you see that um, the casting share in bright blue is the major one. So today, this is dominating uh, with uh, about 65, 66% of both European and North American markets. And then you have sig significantly smaller share um, attributed to a roll product. Uh, so sheet account for 19% in Europe and 23% uh, in North America. Uh, the extruded products um, are even smaller than sheet products, uh, only 11% in Europe today versus 9% in North America. And uh, yeah, the forgings are um, the smallest one, 5% in Europe and 2% only in North America. So if you look at the total aluminum content in um, in tons, in thousand tons, um, you see that we are near to 3 million tons in Europe and um, above uh, 2.7 million tons in North America. So the North American market is smaller today than Europe in terms of total aluminum content. But if you look at the 2025 figures, you see that the North American market
sorry, I think we just may have lost Ellen for a second there, but I can see she's still online, but unfortunately we can't sure. hear her. Oh, no, she's hey. back. There you are. Sorry, Helen. Uh, Carry on. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, sorry, uh, bad connection. Uh, <laughs> This is where we noticed that even in Germany and in the capital of Germany, um, city center, we uh, still have improvement needs in terms of uh, internet infrastructure. <laughs> um, so I don't know exactly how much you missed of my uh, presentation, but I was just about to talk about the evolution toward 2025 with regard to the total aluminum content. Um, so it is increasing faster in North America than in Europe. And um, this is why we, we project uh, about 4.1 million tons net aluminum content for North America in 2025 and 3.6 million for Europe. Um, if you look at the right side, we are looking at the per vehicle aluminum content in kilogram. Um, so, of course, the proportion between casting, sheet extrusion, and forgings are the same as on the left side in percent. And this is why we show you the kilogram numbers. So, for today, uh, in North America, you have uh, more than 135 kilogram of casting in the average light vehicle. Um, more than 48 kilogram of uh, sheets, 20 kilogram of extrusions, and uh, nearly 4 kilogram of forging, which means a total aluminum content per light vehicle of 208 kilogram just for aluminum. That's already huge. For Europe, we are a bit lower. We are uh, 29 kilogram lower. Uh, with a total of 179 kilograms of aluminum per light vehicle on average. And um, this, um, uh, this uh, is related to 118 kilograms of casting, 43 kilograms of sheet, 27 kilograms of extrusions, and nearly 11 kilograms of forging. Looking at the outlook for 2025, we noticed that the, the that delta, the difference between North America and Europe, will remain about the same. Uh, this will be 30 kilogram um, difference. Um, but um, one major difference is that the castings uh, will really lose momentum in their growth in Europe. Uh, so they will grow less than other product forms. Uh, we will only have two kilogram of additional aluminum casting expected as compared to current light vehicle. Uh, while we, we expect a very dynamic growth for um, sheet and extrusion, additional nine kilogram of sheet and additional seven or eight kilogram of extrusions. In North America, uh, we expect also very dynamic growth for sheets, about uh, seven kilogram additional sheet, and uh, dynamic growth for extrusion as well with nearly six kilogram. So that's important to keep in mind. So both markets are growing in terms of average aluminum content per car, which means even if the production forecast that we have uh, looked at at the beginning of the presentation would turn out to be wrong, and maybe the recovery would last longer than expected, um, you can still work with this very important KPI in mind, what is the average content per vehicle to expect? And then you can make your own calculation uh, depending on the number of vehicles being produced. But all in all, for both regions, we expect between uh, 2020 and 2025, an increase by 20 to 21 kilogram of aluminum content per light vehicle. Okay, I need to speed up a little bit. Sorry, <laughs> I take too much time. Um, so I will go uh, a quick through uh, this slide, just show you the average aluminum content um, per uh, vehicle. Um, per segment, A, B, C, D, E. 
And it's very easy to just uh, state that the higher the segment, the higher the aluminum content per vehicle. Um, there is only one exception to this. This is the A segment in North America today, which is higher than the B segment content. Uh, but this is really not a rule. This is, uh, I mean, the A segment is nearly inexistent in North America anyway and will disappear because the only two, I think, if I remember well, um, A segment vehicle being produced in North America today, they won't be produced anymore um, in 2025. So problem solved. <laughs> Um, but but I think these A segment vehicle today are the Chevy Spark and the Fiat 500, and they turn out to be aluminum intensive, which would not be very um, um, characteristic for A segment vehicle. So all in all, uh, the average aluminum content per vehicle ranges from 77 kilogram to 442 kilogram today in the EU. Uh, of course, uh, the higher numbers for the higher segments. And in, in North America today, it ranges between 114 kilogram and 295 kilogram. And this will increase in both regions. Okay, um, here we show you the aluminum content uh, by main application, by main component group, if you wish, um, between today and, and 2005. 25. Uh, so in both regions, uh, it is true that the big sh biggest share of aluminum content relates to engine wheels and uh, transmission, and this will remain true also in the future. Um, but what is interesting to see in the evolution of the percentages, how the content is distributed, is that the ICE powertrain components, as you would expect, we lose share along with the electrification trend going on, while the uh, electrification components, of course, are gaining some share, uh, typically the battery box. This is more obvious in Europe uh, with the battery uh, accounting for uh, only 1% um, or less than 1% today in Europe and expected to account for 8% of the 2025 aluminum content per vehicle. Um, so, uh, and this is because the electrification trend is more advanced in Europe that we can see this shift more obviously uh, in Europe than in North America. But don't forget, because the uh, overall aluminum content per vehicle is increasing in general, uh, even when the uh, percentage share of the component group remains the same, it still shows uh, an increase for uh, this application in terms of aluminum. So here, very quickly, uh, we, we just make the point again that uh, with the electrification going on and while you fully electrify a vehicle into a BEV, some components get redundant like the combustion engine, transmission driveline, some heat, um, uh, heat exchangers, etc. And on the other hand, uh, it creates a need for new components, like uh, one of the biggest ones, the battery box, uh, one or two electric motors, um, uh, gearbox, etc. So we have aluminum losses, and we have aluminum gains as compared to ICE vehicles when we look at BEVs. And there are also further differences between ICE and BEV uh, with regards to the aluminum content. Uh, which is due to an increased aluminum penetration in BEVs for uh, some parts, like, for instance, structural parts in, in enclosures, body structures, uh, uh, etc. So here I think this is a page that will interest you probably most, which is a comp reason on the left side for North America, on the right side for Europe, um, uh, about the aluminum content of an ICE, versus a BEV. So um, you see that um, uh, for the ICE in, in North America, uh, this is about uh, 247 kilogram of aluminum uh, today. And uh, a BEV today in North America has an average of 341 or 42 of aluminum. So this is a net gain of 103 kilograms. And you see how 
you have losses of IC components, 111 kilograms, and gains because you need these BEV-specific components of 214 kilograms of aluminum. The same is shown for Europe on the right side. Um, today we start with an average IC vehicle having 173 kilograms of aluminum content, losing 57 kilograms of aluminum, uh, gaining 204 kilograms of BV specific components, and this makes a net gain for aluminum of 147 kilograms, which is also huge. So um, this means at the end that the ramp up of the BV production will be a very powerful driver for the aluminum demand growth because the aluminum gains uh, exceed by far the aluminum losses. Um, and um, yeah, we'll go to our next page just as an outlook to tell you that we keep in mind we have a growing aluminum content per vehicle. Um, so even with a decreasing um, light vehicle production, we would still have uh, um, uh, probably uh, an increase in aluminum demand. Uh, in the near term, uh, we will be focusing in the electrification on uh, the lithium-ion technology. Um, with uh, OEMs uh, uh, introducing uh, partly dedicated uh, BB, BV platforms, uh, partly also skateboard platforms where the battery box is incorporated in the in the in the chassis, um, and some other OEMs small working with versatile platforms. Most of the OEMs anyway works with a mixed material strategy, so we should not forget in this picture that uh, steel products are also very important with uh, advanced high strength steel. They also have uh, something to contribute to the light weighting. Um, but just to mention that in this near term until 2028, the lithium ion batteries will uh, not exceed a battery, an energy density of 300 watts per kilogram. Um, in the midterm, we count with the introduction uh, into the market of the solid state battery, which would still be using the lithium ion uh, chemistry, but uh, we really expect Daimler and GM uh, before 2030 to work with that. And um, the impact is that the energy density will be um, enhanced by far. So this will be a minimum of 300 watt per kilogram uh, or even 600 watt per kilogram expected, which will help uh, the whole industry to reduce the battery size. Of course, this has an impact on the battery box as well and the battery weight, which also has an impact on the material decision, whether aluminum will be used or not and um, to which extent. In the longer term, after 2035, we expect um, beyond further improvement of battery technologies and, and, and BV um, technologies, that the fuel cell hydrogen technology uh, will come into um, series production and really in mass series production. Uh, because today we are only limited to small volumes like the Toyota Mirai, some experimental series. Um, and that, that's why you didn't see it in the picture of the electrification by powertrain uh, type, by um, electrification type. Um, so again, fuel cell um, technology should further um, enable uh, a downsizing of uh, the battery, so significantly smaller batteries, and also um, much smaller, lighter needs or encapsulation, so much um, lower requirements also for the materials uh, encapsulating the battery. So this will be very exciting to see if this outlook comes in the timeline we expect and how uh, the industry will react to that. I thank you so much and apologize for taking five minutes more than expected. If you have questions, I will be happy to take them. Uh, now and or also later on, feel free to send me an email or give me a call if you have questions around this presentation or more generally about the aluminum market or automotive market or any kind of industrial markets you're interested in. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Ellen. And yes, apologies again for the slight drop in connection there, but it's okay. I think we carried on well. And uh, this just proves that we need live events back because we all need to be in the same room and, uh, and hopefully we won't have certain issues. But fantastic presentation, really interesting to see. Um, obviously, we, we do have one final presentation coming up, which switches more to aluminium foil and packaging. But so for now, um, I've got a couple of, well, I've got one question that we'll definitely ask uh, and then we'll save some for the end. Um, so this question to you then, Ellen, is uh, from one of the participants and just says that as DACA predicts the average content increase in the next five years or 10 years in Europe, uh, North America, for example, the prediction from your company for 2020, how close or far is this prediction against reality? So I hope that question makes some sort of sense to you. Okay, so the question is if our forecasts are close to reality about the aluminum content for recall. Yes, I believe so. Uh, prediction we, we had done for uh, for the associations in North America and in Europe, uh, because I, I mentioned we have been analyzing and monitoring the aluminum content for for a number of years now. Um, we we are pretty much in line. I mean, typically we develop uh, several scenarios: a base scenario, a high scenario, and low scenario. What I presented to you today is a base scenario, but when working with the association or with our corporate client, we also show the high and low scenario. And uh, our cost, our forecast have always been in the range of the high and low without you know, playing too much with a, a, a big share between high and low. So uh, I, I'm confident that we are very, very close to the reality. Also because our methodology has been um, improving in uh, throughout the years, uh, we have started uh, in each region with a sample of vehicles. We have been analyzing, uh, and uh, with each uh, update, we have been increasing our sample. And today, we are looking at nearly 95% of the vehicles uh, being produced. And uh, we are getting our information directly from the key market participants, being in that case the OEMs themselves, making the material decisions and the uh, key component suppliers and material suppliers. So that's why we are very, very close um, to yeah, real-world real <laughs> content. Excellent. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you again for the presentation. I'll save a couple of the questions that we've had come in till the end, because I think they will be quite a good way to add some closing comments and to uh, wrap up. So uh, we'll move on now. And uh, forgive the pun when I say wrapping up, because our next uh, presentation that will look at aluminium foil. Um, so we're actually going to invite Tito Ostenkamp, who is the Executive Director of the European Aluminium Foil Association, to give us a bit of a different look into aluminium in applications and look at the versatility of aluminium foil uses and its environmental impact. So I will hand over to Tito. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadine, and hello to everyone, and thank you very much for the opportunity to we have shown now the versatility of aluminium foil uh, after we have seen a lot of automotive uh, applications. Um, and I will come back uh, to that topic uh, towards the end, so it might be a good wrap up or continuation for the Q&A. Um, okay, it's working so quickly about our association. So we are the European body representing the aluminium foil rollers and the manufacturers of semi-rigid containers used for menu trays or pet food and the household foil manufacturers. We also have sister organizations with, uh, which deal with uh, flexible packaging, um, also a major uh, market for aluminum foil, as I'm going to show you, and aluminum closures. Um, yeah, what we do is typical for an association, a lot of market research and statistics, communication, and uh, yeah, last but not least, and definitely growing, uh, is the area of sustainability, which I will touch also during the presentation continuously. Yeah, what you see here is uh, a Swiss inventor, uh, a visionary uh, called Robert Mayer, um, and uh, his first foil rolling mill. 
Uh, he took out a patent in 1910 for continuous rolling process of aluminium foil and opened his first uh, site or the first site of aluminium foil rolling in Kreuzling at the Lake Constance in Switzerland. Um, he, intent he originally intended to uh, yeah, produce aluminium foil to provide and uh, have an absolute barrier for the balloon, uh, you know, which were um, yeah, a travel vehicle of those times, but uh, obviously it did not really work out, foil and balloons. Uh, but fortunately, a Swiss uh, a colleague named Mr. Tobler began, began wrapping its chocolate bars in aluminium foil, and you can see that still today, in the famous Tobler Rona, uh, meanwhile, part of the Mondelez group, um, and right after, uh, now um, part of Nestle, Maggie uh, started to pack soups and stock cubes um, with aluminium foil because of its properties. Um, those properties are, yeah, in, in terms of the conversion and filling, it's uh, a super machinability and uh, yeah, supports advanced speeds for sealing. It allows uh, sterilization uh, in retort packaging, but it's also easy to print laminate and, and lacquer, etc. And what you can see in many particular uh, confectionery applications, it's that for property safe adhesives. Um, yeah, and stays as it is. Um, but the main property of aluminium foil is actually um, its barrier. It has an absolute barrier uh, against yeah, the, the, the bad things outside and keeps the good things in. Yeah? We call it the gatekeeper. It preserves the nutritional value, taste, and, and quality, uh, and all of that at a very low thickness. Um, and also has all advantages of aluminium material in general, but at this low thickness, and we are talking uh, about standard converter foil uh, around 6 micron, which is uh, 0.006 millimeters, for those who are not uh, familiar with those very low gauges. You know? It also contributes significantly to resource efficiency, particularly of packaging, because of its uh, low thickness. Uh, it still provides this absolute barrier and can be, you know, together with other materials, then provide a, a fantastic packaging. Um, this in total, then, this low packaging to product ratio, which is usually five to ten times lower than rigid alternatives, uh, obviously save a, a lot of materials. This less material used uh, is obviously then less waste which is generated or has to be dealt with afterwards. Yeah? Also this uh, lower material usage allows uh, yeah, less energy use for transportation, um, prior filling but also after filling. And uh, this high barrier um, also allows um, you know, to avoid a certain refrigeration processes, therefore also saving energies. Um, just to give you the example of milk and beverage carton, uh, just 1.5 gram of aluminium foil uh, allow uh, yeah, the perfect storage without cooling chain uh, of this milk. That, just as an example, um, allowed also to provide the East Coast uh, of China, southeastern China, which is the most populated area there, um, f uh, with milk products, with dairy products, which are usually produced and manufactured in the northwest. Um, and then these couple of thousand kilometers of transport uh, are easily done uh, with uh, beverage cartons, for example. Um, it is very versatile, and I'm just showing here you the different packaging and, and packaging and light applications. Um, you know, we differentiate also a bit from a legal perspective, aluminium packaging, which is dominant aluminium packaging, typically yogurt lids, confectionery cheese wraps, uh, farmer blisters, a semi-rigid container I referred to already, 
but also aluminum foil in packaging. There usually aluminum foil is the minor component. Uh, how minor, I'm going to show in a second. And there is also this so-called non-packaging, uh, like kitchen utensils, add household foil, or containers when they are used as barbecue trays or retail packs to be used uh, at home, etc. But interestingly enough, um, in the, from a legal perspective, also coffee capsules are not packaging because the content, the coffee powder, uh, yeah, remains within the, the capsule after its use. You know? Overall, we are talking a, a demand in and for packaging with foil in Europe of about 700,000 tons per year, and that is almost equal and, and very comparable to the demand of an aluminium beverage can, uh, which is yeah, one single uh, item and probably the, the more prominent uh, item in the aluminium world when it comes to packaging. Um, I was uh, already said something about this aluminum foil and composite packaging, and the beverage carton is a very good example. And when we go from the outer to the inner layers, there are uh, uh, five main layers. So that's polyethylene, which protects the carton against moisture from the outside. The relatively cheap Cardboard provides the stability and strength, and then another uh, layer of polyethylene is used as an adhesive layer between cardboard and aluminum foil, which then really protect, protects the product against oxygen and light, uh, typical you know, enemies of food, and preserve also the flavor and, and nutrition. And then in the inside, there is another layer of uh, polyethylene, which seals the liquid and protects the aluminium against any corrosion. Um, talking about the material shares by weight, uh, just five percent of aluminium uh, in a in, uh, just five percent of the weight in a beverage carton is aluminium. Twenty percent is plastic, and then seventy-five percent is the cardboard. That's why there, it a, enables them to call it cart, uh, carton and not composite. Uh, semi-rigid brick. Yeah. Um, yeah, talking about aluminum foil and packaging for liquids, here you have the full range. Uh, I already mentioned the beverage carton, which is used for juices, milk, but also for spirits or wine. Um, then you have a lot of pouches for juices, uh, but also spirits and wines. And uh, the capsules and more decorative um, items for bottleneck, um, uh, beers or like recently also cider, but also the famous champagne capsule, uh, which everybody knows. Um, a more recent um, development is the so-called foil lid on, a, on top of a beverage can, uh, which provides uh, additional hygiene uh, properties for the cans. And when we talk about yeah, filling speed, I, I referred to the machinability. Um, beverage cartons are filled uh, at 800 uh, cartons a minute, and uh, the can lids, for example, are applied if was, uh, on 50,000 cans per hour. So we are talking really about high-speed uh, filling, and it always has to perform. Uh -huh. uh, not usually sold in liquid, but ending up as a liquid uh, product is aluminum foil for coffee packaging, also significant market. The um, more traditional are the vacuum packs, but also the pouches for the, the, the full beans uh, used. And not too recently, but relatively new are, is the entire capsule market. Um, and talking about speed here, um, we uh, the, the filling speed is up to four, 240 capsules a minute. Um, aluminum foil is really used for uh, coffee packaging because of its sensitivity uh, of the coffee towards a particular oxygen and therefore requires a perfect barrier. Um, the aluminum capsule for coffee is becoming more and more popular, so we see more and more companies besides the original Nespresso brand um, yeah, promoting aluminium as the choice of material for high coffee quality 
in several uh, European and, and global markets, and not just from uh, one other major coffee um, brand owner, but also from other also private label manufacturers for coffee. Aluminium foil is also widely used as lids, uh, most typical for yogurt um, or yogurt drinks, but also in, uh, when it comes to some more medical and pharmaceutical packaging, for example, for contact lenses, but also in conjunction with steel cans as a, a relatively easy to open um, lid. Uh, you see the, the, the peanut butt, uh, the peanut the can here uh, where foil is uh, uh, sealing uh, the, the peanut, also a very sensitive product. Talking about filling speed or the reasons why the lids are used for yogurt, um, it is, has to be sealed uh, very quickly. Um, a filling line of yogurt is uh, running up to 600 yogurt pots a minute and the yogurt is relatively liquid, almost like water in the, uh, at the point in uh, filling. Um, and then it has to be sealed to the, the plastic cup uh, very quickly. And aluminum foil with its uh, heat conductivity really provides uh, uh, a great function here. And it seals it perfectly. And when it comes to um, yeah, larger diameters, aluminum foil in contrast to other materials also prevents uh, any uh, yeah, producing so-called waves. You know, when you, when you apply a lot of heat for the seam on a plastic lid, then you have always the danger of, of uh, creating waves, which obviously does not look very nice. And for those who ever wondered why an aluminum foil lid is always embossed or, that, or has some and lacquered dots uh, or brand uh, logos on top of it. That is the reason to have a little air layer between the lids and, and at the point of filling so that the machine can really quickly grab lid uh, to, to apply it on the, on the yogurt cup uh, during the filling process. Uh -huh. uh, another big and, and Popular market is confectionery. Um, I guess a lot of you will already have seen the first Santa Clauses uh, on the supermarket shelves. Uh, it's uh, yeah, less than well, it's about two and a half months to go for Christmas, and therefore uh, yeah, we will see a lot of Santa Clauses, but also other confectionery packed in aluminium foil. And aluminium foil is really a, a great choice here because of its depth foldability, it perfectly um, yeah, wraps around uh, those hollow uh, figures uh, of chocolate, uh, which no other material can do. Uh, it can be opened and, 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 and reclosed uh, for those who have the discipline uh, not uh, eating a, a Santa Claus or even an Easter bunny at once. Um, and uh, aluminum foil also provides a perfect barrier to chocolate, uh, allowing it uh, not to turn uh, grayish, etc. Um, market data for um, these hollow figures, for example, uh, surprisingly, the Santa Claus is not as often sold as the Easter bunny um, in, in the major market, which is Germany, to give you an idea. Uh, around 150 million Santa Clauses are sold on, on German retail per year, uh, while it's more than 220 million Easter bunnies sold. Yeah, so um, Easter uh, Easter bunnies seem to be a bit more popular than the Santa Clauses. Uh -huh. But also a lot of pralines over the year and, and, and chocolate bars are wrapped in aluminum foil, in particular when it comes to premium. Uh, yeah, chocolate or when it should have a premium uh, appearance to this. Yeah. Uh, another uh, yeah, big market uh, uh, for aluminum foil is the pet food market. And we have here certain and, and, uh, different categories of products which can be used for. It's uh, the pouch, um, uh, usually a flat pouch uh, for wet food packaging. But also the, uh, which is also quite popular, the semi-rigid container, which is not just a container, but also, and here we're referring again for lids, 
uh, usually always has an aluminium lid on it. Uh, you can put it in different shapes and sizes, uh, but also other laminates for uh, other treats for the, the, the pads are using aluminium foil because it needs really this absolute barrier um, and also then in the retort process uh, it, it needs to withstand a lot of um, um, things. Yeah, um, talking about market sizes uh, or markets for pet food, uh, the pouch is in terms of units definitely um, bigger than the semi-rigid container market annually more than 12 billion pouches for wet pet food are sold either for dog or cat pet food on European shelves and uh, while well, for the city rich container it's only 3.7 billion but you have to consider that these um, the, the, the content of a uh, semi-rigid container is usually a bit higher than for a pouch. The pouch is generally, you know, around 100, or it used to be around 100 gram uh, content, but the increasing um, uh, minimization of dogs uh, used uh, or purchased in, in, in health uh, is going down. Also, the pouches or the content for the pouches is going down. Yeah? So uh, I'm referring always to the hand size uh, dogs, uh, yeah, uh, handbag size dogs. Yeah? Therefore, you, you need less um, content, but the pouch is almost as, as big as for a normal one. Um, not the biggest, but uh, in terms of uh, importance, a very significant market as well is the market for pharmaceutical applications. And mainly we're talking here about blister foils or aluminium aluminium blisters for even higher um, protection of the very sensitive uh, pharmaceutical products uh, and also laminates uh, for tablets or uh, powders, etc. So this is a very significant uh, market. It, uh, aluminium blister or this aluminium packaging has to withstand um, tropical conditions uh, as a requirement uh, and uh, shelf lives of uh, two or in more years. So there, there are very significant and, and, and big requirements from the pharmaceutical companies, but those are also quite efficient in the filling process. You have to imagine that on a modern filling line, uh, up to 1,300 blisters are packed per minute. So that is really high speed, and the, the packaging, including foil, really has to perform well uh, during this uh, filling process. And that's why we call this kind of packaging is also a high-tech product. Um, I already mentioned it a couple of times, but it is from uh, importance uh, also and producer manufacturing things also in own category. These are aluminum foil containers. It's used as retort applications for meat, fish, pet food, but also ready meals. And uh, a lot of us have experienced that during the pandemic when we yeah, uh, asked for catered uh, food, a warm food, uh, then we often received uh, the, the meals in aluminum foil containers. But it's also used in, in barbecuing, so kitchen as kitchen utensils, but also catering in general. Coffee I already mentioned. Uh, I haven't mentioned all the cakes and desserts uh, used uh, or put in aluminum foil containers, also baked in aluminum foil containers. And more recently, there are even some uh, medical applications for semi-rich containers uh, coming up. You know? The most uh, iconic uh, product of the aluminium industry, which the, uh, the, the people on the street uh, quickly recognize and think of, is the aluminium household foil, um, mainly used for barbecue. So uh, if somebody's interested, we put some uh, recipes using aluminium foil created by the Vice World Champion in barbecuing on our website. But more seriously, um, uh, we conducted a couple of years ago a study in a, in, in a life cycle assessment study um, comparing aluminium foil with a reusable plastic container uh, for sandwiches. And the study, uh, which was peer-reviewed, uh, yeah, came to the conclusion that uh, 
a lemony foil household foil is at least comparable in terms of our mental uh, impact um, to a reusable uh, plastic container. Um, and in that study, the production of foil was compared with, with the efficient dishwashing of a plastic box. Um, and that went uh, against many perceptions uh, of reusable is better than, than single use. Having talked a lot about uh, packaging and, and kitchen applications, I would now like to come to technical applications, starting with insulation and, and heat exchangers. Um, these technical applications overall um, represent about 25% of Europe's aluminium foil demand. Uh, also very versatile, it is used in pipes and also in cars, and now we are Coming back to the automotive sector, you know, shielding in the car for engine parts, etc., but also in um, in cable wraps, uh, so in cables as a, as a wrapping material to protect the inner layer cable parts from moisture and in other um, uh, enemies. Um, aluminium, in general, we all know, is a, a great uh, thermal. Uh, conductor and therefore it is used widely in heat exchangers to facilitate the transfer of heat from one system to another and foil with its thin gauges in multiple layers provide then really big surface uh, in little volume. This is really the, the great example or the, the uh, advantage of aluminum foil in, in heat exchangers. Uh, but it's used in uh, refrigeration, air conditioning, but also in cars and trucks. Uh, uh, so again, the proof that aluminium, that not just alum, uh, rigid aluminium and heavier aluminium parts are used in aluminium automotive, but also in uh, in the light material, thin materials. Um, Helen already mentioned a lot the uh, electrification of um, automotives and. Inside the battery, uh, aluminum foil plays a significant role because it acts as the cathode, while the copper foil is uh, the anode, and aluminum foil is the only material which can um, yeah, provide the function as a cathode in a lithium-ion battery. Uh, yeah, and that is not likely to change. Um, on top of the being used inside uh, of the batteries. It is also used uh, outside, uh, for example, of the uh, shielding for these battery pouches, which are also made with aluminum foil. And as we have seen with Helen and, and, and also Stick, the, there is a big potential and likelihood of a growing market for uh, electric vehicles. And even if you consider um, that uh, hydropower is, is coming up this, yeah, for, for the cars, then uh, there are also batteries uh, necessary. So it's not just for the next, but also for the over next generation, um, essential to use aluminum foil. Mm -hmm. um, talking about the environmental footprint of um, aluminum foil, and here I showed the life cycle. Um, yeah, unfortunately, the production of primary aluminium accounts for about 90% of the foil's footprint, uh, taking a cradle to gate approach, um, and it's just, uh, yeah, 10% for the foil production itself. But obviously, this can be reduced also, what, what Stick showed at the beginning, uh, that you can significantly reduce it, this. Uh, when using or when recycling aluminium widely and uh, yeah, bringing it back into the, the material loop. Yeah. Um, aluminium foil perfectly fits uh, for circular economy. Um, it, uh, you know, as I showed, its packages are, are uh, an essential component also to prevent food waste, etc. But the um, when it's used as a major component, it can be easily recycled uh, with the general aluminium recycling stream in the beginning. Laminate can be either treated in pyrolysis uh, to recover the aluminium, but also new technologies are 
uh, under development and, and implemented right now uh, that uh, aluminum foil uh, from laminates can be recycled also with the other materials. As we all know, um, it, there is no uh, quality loss uh, of the aluminum during the recycling process. So this is also for the packaging um, industry and, and community. Aluminum foil can be recycled. Uh, but first of all, we have to collect it. Yeah? So we cannot recycle anything without uh, proper collection. And therefore, we always pledge, OK, increase recycling, optimize, uh, um, increase collection, and optimize the collection routes. Uh, and then it can be easily separated in sorting centers. There are great technologies, meanwhile. Uh, and obviously, we have to prevent any packaging, not just plastics, to, to be leaked into the environment. Uh, also, aluminium uh, has to play a role here. Um, and we are working European-wide uh, with many initiatives to improve the recycling of aluminium foil, uh, either via the aluminium route or via the flexible packaging route, um, for example, uh, C-Flex. Uh, in delamination technologies, aluminium foil can play uh, a positive role, but also in, in the so-called chemical recycling of plastics, um, aluminium foil is not seen as a disruptor, so and therefore uh, goes well along with it. Yeah? Currently, in the current calculation methods, um, we estimate aluminium packaging recycling rate in Europe uh, already exceeds the 60%. But to be very honest, it is, uh, yeah, thanks to the beverage can to, to have this. And the, the lighter the packaging, the more difficult the collection and recycling. But we are working on this. Mm -hmm. Overall, and uh, here I would like to conclude, is, uh, yeah, as I've shown, is uh, aluminum foil is a very versatile material for an even more versatile number of different applications. Uh, both in the packaging and the like, and also technical application sector. It is very often not visible, but provides really essential function to the pro uh, product, either you know in the delivery of food, medical, or then technical issues like in the battery foil. Um, fortunately, and we have seen that in the, in the pandemic as well, aluminum foil is a very significant and stable market for the aluminum upstream industry. Around 9% of the uh, primary aluminium are, uh, is going into the uh, aluminium foil sector. Um, and aluminium foil also supports the sustainable consumption and production. And um, what I hoped to have shown you, it fits very well into a circular economy, which is being on the development uh, right now. And this is the end, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Guido, for that really great presentation. It's really good to have seen a different side of aluminium, obviously, in use as an application. Uh, so we've had a few questions come through. So what I'll do is I'll ask a couple of questions to uh, Guido, and then we can have a bit of a conclusion with Guido. And then I've also got a few uh, questions just for Ellen and Dig to finish up today. Uh, so Guido, coming to you then first, one of the questions we've had come in that somebody would like to ask is, what are the main competitors of aluminium as a packaging material? And what material do you see as packaging of the future? So that's quite a, quite a good question. Obviously, I would uh, love to say aluminium foil is the, the, the answer to the future or in the future. But to be realistic, um, uh, aluminium Oil um, has as major competitors plastic uh, and but also increasingly paper. And that is mainly due to the reduced requirement to the barrier functions. Um, in some applications and other applications, aluminum foil is then the answer of, of substituting plastics and papers. Uh, so we are going in, in both directions. and. Uh, yeah, aluminium foil has a, will have a great future, um, like it had uh, over the 110, last 10 years. Excellent. That's good to hear. 
Um, and then so just on that point as well, do you think we are being innovative, innovative even enough as a, an industry when it comes to the potential behind aluminium packaging? Do you think we could be doing more or is there anything else we're not really exploring at the moment? No, I think the, the, the industry is supporting the, the foil industry um, oh, yeah, in, 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 a, in a good way um, in terms of uh, a lot of things. We have the issue with the aluminium foil industry that we are not usually the, the classical aluminium industry because aluminium foil applications are rather used together with other materials and not necessarily competing with other materials. Sure, thank you very much. Well, I'll just um, come back to some of our other speakers now as well because we, we've we got some other questions that also relate to obviously our look into uh, automotive vehicles and aluminium and automotive. Um, and then I'll, I'll bring back one final question for Guido at the end so that we can have just a, a closing comment there as well. Um, but Ellen, if you are hopefully still there and we've not lost you, um, just to bring in a final point from you and looking at these cast products for BEV. Uh, one of the questions that's come in says, which production technologies were regarded as the most promising when it came to these casting products for BEV? Okay. So uh, yeah, basically the situation uh, may differ between uh, BEVs and PHEV. So I understand the question was related to BEV. Um, so for BEV, the cast uh, content is very limited anyway. We mainly find the, the casting solution uh, for, for, I mean, if, if you look at the battery box, yes, um, um, in, in BH, PHEV, we tend to have a, a battery tray uh, which is cast. Um, I, I guess the technology is the HPDC, so high pressure die casting. But I'm not 100% sure about that. So, um, but I think this is what would make the most sense. And also, in the application in BEVs, and this would not be for a battery tray, but um, probably for the cross members in the battery, uh, maybe also some brackets uh, in the battery box that are uh, cast. Uh, it also makes sense because it's a very um, uh, structural safety relevant part. Uh, to use the HPDC potentially with vacuum assistance. But uh, I cannot say 100% sure that this would be HPDC or, or VDC. No, thank you for answering that. Um, just then on some final closing comments from you. And one thing um, I just want to ask as well, from, uh, just in your opinion, uh, are we doing enough and can we be doing more as manufacturers when Obviously, you mentioned that um, light weighting alone is not kind of sufficient in, in taking these sustainability standards as seriously as we need to be. Um, so what should our, you know, a real point of action be for us as an industry? Um, okay, so um, again, uh, mass saving will be a, a strong contributor, but uh, when you look, depending where you come from, um, how many grams per kilometer CO2 emissions you can save um, by uh, specific measures. Uh, uh, mass saving is important, but uh, again, if you have the chance, like in North America, to still have uh, much room for uh, optimization of your powertrain, uh, then you can achieve a significant uh, CO2 emission reduction. I mean, let's start with the reduction of uh, the number of cylinders. Um, let's talk about uh, uh, transmission upgrade, yeah? increasing the number of gears from five gears to six gears or six gear to seven gears or uh, switching to dual clutch or, or, or CVT transmission. This is very powerful. Uh, of course, uh, if it's not the case, uh, start-stop uh, measures uh, in, in North American market is also very powerful. Uh, the mild hybridization with the 48 volt battery is also powerful. Uh, it, it could bring like 10% or 15% of uh, CO2 emission uh, reduction. So these are very powerful measures, uh, but there is al always a cost associated with each of these uh, CO2 emission 
rejection measure. And uh, this is where each OEM for each specific nameplate has to decide where is the right mix between um, CO2 emission reduction versus cough? Because uh, we have to say in some cases that uh, consciously some OEMs make the choice to not meet the target on specific vehicles because they know that it will be uh, cheaper in, in Europe to pay the penalties for exceeding the target instead of investing in the uh, measure that would allow for reaching the target. So, yeah, this is a, a complex uh, decision to make. Thank you very much, Ellen. And I'll just aim this, a similar style question over to Stig as well, but mainly just your thoughts on the challenges we kind of face going forward. Obviously, this uh, this look at the differences between renewable um, energy, aluminium that has been produced from renewable energies and low carbon aluminium, and also this recycled aluminium. So. Just your final comments on uh, where we're going as an industry and, and any points you would like to finalize on. Yes, uh, uh, that, that's a good question. Uh, I think my main point was that uh, we have to expect as an industry to get increased attention on, uh, on raw material selection in, in vehicles since, since the focus will be on the, on the vehicle, more on the vehicle production phase. And I think then the industry needs to have um, available, call it greener alternatives, uh, whether that's with a higher recycled content or whether it's a higher share of, of renewable energy in, uh, in, in the mix. So, so I think the, the, the industry needs to prepare for that future and have alternatives available. And I think also we need to expect that, uh, that uh, OEMs want to simulate the actual carbon footprint by simulating the, the, the supply chains. Uh, so knowing exactly what the footprint are in, in their products. Uh, so this is one side of it. I think the other side of it, uh, try to make a point of, of that the business case of flight rating remain very favorable also in battery electric vehicles, uh, motivating a higher use of aluminium. But, uh, I would also like to emphasize, and I think that Helen did the same in her presentation, uh, that there are other alternatives for light weighting, uh, and especially the, the high strength steel variants. So I think the, the aluminum industry needs to continue to innovate and come up with competitive solutions to, main, to maintain that aluminum is the material of choice for these new electrical vehicle applications. Uh, of course, if we lose that battle as an industry, it can have drastic impacts on, on the aluminium consumption. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, Stig. Some really interesting points raised there. And I, uh, I think it's been a really good uh, webinar session today, especially just to be able to see all these different areas of, uh, of the applications. And just bringing back to you, though, just for a final closing comment, and obviously moving again on to uh, the aluminium foil applications. Um, Guido, your your comments on you know more of a, a short term and a long term view of the industry. You did mention some of these areas of demand that we're now seeing. Um, where do you see this demand mainly for short term and, and long term going forward? And your your final comment, please. Thank you. Yeah, short term, the um, the demand for packaging will be at least steady, and with the um, yeah further development in developing countries and the need for more packaging, also aluminium foil will will have a higher demand in the mid and long term. That will continue and be yeah uh, also supported by the, the, the market and technical applications like battery, foil, um, and, but also further heat exchangers, etc. Mm. Thank you very much. Good to end on those points there. Um, so we will finish there. It's been a really great session. I hope everybody has been able to take something away from today. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us and to all of our esteemed speakers as well. If you would like to know any more about any of the topics discussed today, then the slides will be available online and a recording of this session will also be uploaded for you to view at your leisure. So you can just view these 
on www.aluminiumtoday.com forward slash online showcase. And we will be back again at the same time tomorrow, but we'll be looking at the impact of automation and robotics technologies across the aluminium manufacturing process. So it should be another really interesting session. Uh, how are companies adopting to industry four and what are the challenges we face as a sector there? So hopefully you can all join us for that as well. Thank you again, and we wish you a great rest of your day.